Hello. Today uh, we're having a panel on silver, the technology, metal, and market. I'm Chris Thompson for E Research, and I'm here with a very distinguished panel who are going to talk about silver and the silver market. Uh, to my left, I have Peter Clousy from Silver Bullet Mines. I have Byron King, who is a columnist for Investor Intel. I have Chris Ball from Bald Eagle Gold, and I have Simon Ridgeway from Volcanic Gold Mines. How are you today, guys? Very good. Well, thanks. Good to be here. <laughs> well, silver has been used as an as a instrument of trade for, for thousands of years uh, as a precious metal. Uh, but more and more modern times, we're seeing it using as a technology metal. So we're going to sort of discuss today the silver and the silver market, uh, where things are going and, and how it's being used and, and some of your thoughts. Uh, is that a good place to start? Sure. So uh, the precious metal market has uh, sort of hit a peak uh, in, the, in the last uh, little while, uh, the highest it's been in the last 10 years, although uh, in the last uh, few months it's come off a little bit. Uh, why don't we start with uh, Byron, you give us a, a little bit of an overview of the silver market. Well, silver, as you mentioned, has two, has two functions. It's, uh, it's sort of, it has a, a monetary feel to it, but it, a heavily industrial feel to it as well. Uh, you know, when people say, oh, we're going to do solar panels. Well, that means we're going to do silver panels. You know, in a lot of respects, silver is the next lithium. Uh, at the same time, you know, silver moves quite closely with gold as a monetary metal. Uh, when gold sells off, as is the case right now as we speak during a market sell down, uh, when gold drops, uh, silver drops as well. Uh, but uh, silver should have its day uh, as things unfold, just as there's not enough copper in the world to run all the wires, there's not enough silver in the world to do all the electronics that you know that, that the world has planned for itself. And Simon, what about your thoughts on the silver market? Well, you know, it's been a, the, the, the gold silver ratio has always been a little, a lot better for silver. I'm going to argue with you about that gold silver ratio. I'm coming back to you. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, it, you know, I'm, I'm an explorationist, so I, I, look, I look for deposits that are economic at today's price. I'm not very good at predicting where the prices are going to go. So today's silver is just over $20. You know, I think right, I've found a couple of mines, silver mines over the last 15 years, and they would both make money at this price of silver. So, you know, is silver got an upside in the future? I think so. But today's price is, is good today. If you find a, you know, something with three or four ounces per ton, yep. you're probably good to go. Chris, what about you? What were your thoughts about the silver market? Oh yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I think I think we're seeing a bit of a dash for cash right now. Uh, you know, the general equities are, are certainly rolling over. Um, you know, real estate is, is, is probably topped out. You know, the crypto market is, is, is crashing. So, you know, people are selling a lot of other asset classes right now. There's a lot of fear in the market. And, uh, you know, we're seeing a dash for cash. But, you know, when the inflation is, is upwards of 9%, you know, we're, we're hitting 40 year highs. That's not exactly the safest place to uh, to keep your cash either, or to, to keep your wealth either, I should say. So, uh, you know, I think I think people are going to start catching on to precious metals and and gold and and silver in particular. I mean, I think uh, gold is going to be a very safe place uh, to to store your wealth, but uh, I think investors looking for more leverage um, are, are going to look at silver, which uh, you know typically uh, will outperform gold um, in in times like this. And Peter, your thoughts on the silver market? <laughs> we'll come back to the gold-silver ratio later. Um, speaking corporately and selfishly, we don't care. And that's because we are, production is imminent at our silver mine. So we're not looking at the long-term macro, we're not looking at the broader environment right now. We're maniacally focused on getting our mine into production. So the ratio and the macro don't matter to us. We know what our numbers are, we can make money, get the mine into production. So Good attitude. It, yeah. it keeps above that price, you're going to be okay. Yeah, we know what that price is. We don't have a PA, so I can't tell you, but we know what that price is. So uh, we've mentioned the, the gold-silver ratio before, so let's just briefly talk about that, and maybe I'll get Byron to explain for people who may not know what the gold-silver ratio is, and, it, uh, and we can go from there. Sure. Uh, the gold-silver ratio basically is how many ounces of silver does it take to buy an ounce of gold? Or if you had an ounce of gold, how many ounces of silver? In the olden days of the United States when there were $20 gold pieces and $1 uh, silver dollars, the ratio was 20 to one. 
uh, goes back to the founding of the Republic. In fact, Alexander Hamilton set the ratio at 15 to 1, and it was a scandal a few years later when the ratio went to 16 to 1. But for, <laughs> for almost a century, over a century, it was 20 to 1. But today, for example, right now as we speak, or before we came on camera, gold was selling at something around $1,830. Silver was selling at something around under 21. If you do the math, that's around 90 to 1 or so. 90 to 1 is not 20 to 1. So people might say that gold is overvalued. People might say silver is undervalued. Um, I think I think it's more like silver is undervalued. And uh, you know, but and, but if silver were to catch up to the historical, you know, 20 to 1 or something like that ratio, I mean, you're looking at a very significant uh, multiple of uh, silver uh, move in terms of price. That's big macro kind of stuff. But that's what the silver ratio is in a general sense. Peter, did you want to comment on that? You look like you're ready to go. I'm ready to go. <laughs> You've heard me say this before. The gold and silver ratio is no longer the gold and silver ratio. It's now what people think the gold and silver market will be. It's like if you go to Vegas, those aren't the odds. Those are what the odds makers set as the odds based on what they think you're going to bet. That's why the Yankees always have a lot of money on them, because they're such a well-known franchise. The, the Dallas Cowboys are the same thing. The gold-silver ratio is the same thing. You're now betting against other people betting on the gold-silver ratio. You're no longer tracking the gold-silver ratio. So do you think in the marketplace itself, it's not telling something about the fundamentals of the market? It's always nice to take money from the newbies. So I mean, uh, do you have a comment I, about the gold-silver uh, ratio? I think the, the, the gold-silver ratio, I mean, you know, from the time I've been involved in exploration, which is probably the last 20 years, it's been in that 60 to one range, I mean, it's been up in 100 to 1 recently, but I think there's a better upside in silver than there is in gold for that reason. And silver is also now not just an investment metal, but it's a, you know, it's a battery metal, so to speak. So I think there's a, a better upside in silver than there is in gold. Well, you can see silver doubling. You can't see gold doubling. Well, that's that's what I was just going to say. Yeah, right now, yeah. with, with gold's at, at I think 1850. So if you want to double your money in gold, it's got to go to 3700. Um, which could happen, don't get me wrong, but, but right now silver's trading closer to 20 bucks. So, I mean, you know, silver could, could much easier, I mean, silver's gone to $50 just recently in 2011. Uh, yeah. It, it yeah. did it before uh, in 1980, so it's done it twice before. So yeah, I think you're- At that price, the top of gold was about 2000, right? So gold's come off, you know, 10% and silver's come up by 50%. So let right. me, let me just throw, throw something into that discussion as well. When, when the price of gold drifts down, you know, people say, well, that's because the dollar is strengthening. And, you know, it gets back to that old argument that the dollar is the cleanest, dirty shirt in the laundromat, you know, but, but <laughs> what's going on with the dollar is that Europe is in huge trouble, you know, because of the Russia-Ukraine matter. And then Europe is running out of energy. They basically shot themselves in both feet with both barrels of the shotgun, and now they're taking a pistol and they're blowing each hand off and whatever, in terms of you were shutting off natural gas, shutting off oil. They don't have any energy. Europe's gonna have a tough, tough, tough time going ahead until they get their act together. So a lot of that European money moves to the dollar. The dollar strengthens in a nominal sense, and that helps to put a lid on gold prices, which again, tends to you know, uh, depress the silver price as well, just because, like you say, the odds makers are, you know, you're betting on what the odds makers think the odds are gonna be. But, but you know, the, the dollar strength is really an artifact of Euro land weak, weakness, yeah. and that's an artifact of incredibly bad diplomacy that has basically you know, lost them a war, and it's costing them their energy uh, the, to run Europe with. But that's a whole other story. So one related, unrelated thing is uh, both Canada and the United States have a list of critical metals. Mm -hmm. Silver's not on that list in either country. It should be. It should. It absolutely should be. Right, it absolutely you're that should because be. You're going to be mining silver, yeah. but should it be? I mean, is, you know, is it that critical to the? To, is it that so, critical to battery metals, to electric yeah. cars, to telephones? Well, I think it is. It, it definitely it, is. It definitely is. I mean, it's, it's a byproduct of, of a lot of mines. Yes. Yeah. So. So let, let, let's talk about the supply side. So, it, you know, is the price of silver then influenced by uh, the current supply side? It, it, it's a byproduct of many mines. There's not a lot of original silver production out there. Let's talk with the silver explorers and we'll get to the silver producers soon. Yeah. But on the exploration side, uh, how do you see this, uh, you know, looking at, looking for silver assets, you know, are they harder to find? Is that going to influence well, the price I, mean, of I think gold, silver, they're all harder to find over the last 20 years because of exploration companies such as Volcanic Gold have spent 
pretty much worldwide in, 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 in getting the investment capital to explore for it. But I think there's still a lot of silver deposits, primary silver deposits to be found, Central America. I mean, the, the difficult part is where most of the silver deposits are, Peru, Argentina, Mexico, exploration and permitting is getting way, way more difficult in, in all of those countries. So, you know, it, the challenge of finding more deposits isn't just the, the exploration upside, it's, it's getting permitted, getting the social license to explore in those areas, which is quite difficult now in Central America yeah. and, and, and South America in general. Yeah. Well, like you said, it, it, it's getting more and more challenging to find uh, primary silver. I mean, silver is, is quite often a byproduct, um, you know, at, at many other copper and, and gold mines. So uh, finding pure play or, or primary silver in safe jurisdictions is, is definitely becoming increasingly challenging. All the easy stuff is, has been found. The low sure. hanging fruit is gone. The low hanging fruit is gone. More science needed. So and more, more boots on the ground, basically. Uh, from the Silver Institute, roughly 1.2 billion, billion ounces of production in 2021. Roughly 25% came from primary silver mines. Roughly 10% came from recycling. So that's 65% where it's a byproduct of nickel, copper, iron, the usual suspects. So does that mean that uh, those, those producing mines can you know, change their production to meet the demand for silver or uh, to, to lower the price down? If it no, I think more discovery is needed. More discovery of primary silver deposits or even gold, you know, gold silver, copper silver deposits. And I think there's, like I said, I think there's still a lot more to be found. It's just, it's a slower process now. Exploration is more difficult. Permitting is way more difficult. So, but uh, there's still a lot out there to be found. Unless silver skyrockets, I can't see any major changing its production profile to scale back on copper and kick out more silver. You, you would need to have a massive spike in the price. And, and from a uh, development standpoint, how are you seeing developing a silver mine? The, the challenges on the supply side of uh, the economy these days, what are you seeing? Well, we're in a safe jurisdiction, which really helps. Um, when we raised capital, we told the broader story that we have a big silver vein, we're gonna put it in production as fast as we can. So it wasn't so much about silver as it was the production story. Uh, whether we were producing gold or nickel really didn't matter in this particular story. It was the speed weight of production that resonated with investors. And did you have any challenges in on the permitting side? Minimal. We had some, but minimal, all things considered. You, you had issues with just the supply chain and getting the yes. equipment that you need. To, yes. So that's an interesting story. That we lost 70 enough. days because we had a ship, big shipping container. It was lost somewhere in Long Beach. They knew it was in Long Beach, but they didn't know where in Long Beach. And of course, that's the container with the motor, the chain, and a bunch of other stuff needed to make the ball mill actually turn. So we lost 70 days of production to, to the supply chain issues. The shipping used to be $1 a mile, now it's five. Welding rods were 60 bucks each, now they're 300. So we're being affected by the supply chain. Yeah, yeah. all mines will be, all mines in the future will be. Certainly metal prices are rising all over. Fuel prices are rising. Permitting's longer, but you know. Uh, so, getting mines in production. When, when we made the discovery, we put the silver in in San Jose from discovery hall to production was probably three and a half years. I think that now would be quite impossible in any country in Latin America. You know, from discovery to production. Yeah. So, so, so even at the importance of silver and some of the modern technologies, are you still going to see governments, uh, you know? Increasing the permitting time and being more careful with the mines. Yeah, I don't think they. I don't think they put one and one together to get two. No. Of that. I mean, you know, the social issues, the the anti-mining sentiment that's throughout Latin America, mostly brought on by NGO groups, Catholic Church, Oxfam. Yeah. Some of the some of the primary causes yeah. of that. But in fairness, some of the miners have been really crappy at ESG, and the good guys wind up bearing the brunt of that in the form of increased permitting. As a whole, we need to be really good at ESG. Yeah, well, I think most. I think these days, most companies are. It's, you know, it's most companies are. In most companies, like. We were talking about a group of idiots who went drilling in Ontario without going to see First Nations. Yeah, well, you, you get there are there are always the odd one, but for the most part, most mining companies are very sensitive to ESG. On the environmental side, they're very good. Um, things have improved significantly over the last decade or 15 years, I believe, in those areas. Yeah. 
Yeah, so how, the and, how are you seeing things and where you're located? Well, well yeah, I was just going to say, just, just to add on to that, is, is it's about education too. And, yeah. it, you know, and, and we definitely are, are seeing a lot more you know, public education about critical metals and, and their role in, in green energies, but I think that's still very poorly understood. Uh, by a lot of the environmental groups out there, right? There's, there's always been a huge disconnect between, uh, you know, where all these green energy technologies actually come from um, and, and how they're produced, right? Right at mines. So, I think it's a combination of we, we definitely, as a whole, have to be better at ESG. Uh, you know, like we discussed, um, you know, before governments and policymakers are, are going to start changing their ways and, and allowing I us to fast track the local communities wherever you work in. Absolutely. You know, to, to a big degree. Absolutely. So NSR is more spread up more locally as opposed to central governments making sure they participate in the project from a very early stage. They're involved in the exploration, right. you know, to, to understand the And we have it relatively easy, right? American rare earths, for example, they have to explain rare earths. All right, I got this mountain and I'm going to get, right? At least we have silver. People understand silver. Yeah. And people need to understand that silver is actually used in, in you know, solar panels and, and electric vehicles. I mean, a lot of people know copper and cobalt and these sorts of things, but, you know, that education is important. And, you know, Chris, to answer your question, like, our, our project is in Idaho, and we've actually hired a group out of Boise uh, that, that's helping us get introductions to the local stakeholders, the local ranching yeah. association. Yeah. Um, because, you know, coming from Canada, coming from a foreign place, you know, we can't just expect to walk into a new project and we know everyone, right? Um, so they're helping us build those uh, relationships and, and things like that are important. It's important to, you know, frame the narrative early that, that we're not here to destroy the environment. We're here to build something. We're here to create wealth, create jobs, and actually, you know, create, produce a metal that's good for the environment. Yeah, and you've got to choose your location then as well. And oh, absolutely. Places. I think one of the key takeoffs of what we're all discussing here is that in addition to the traditional up-down cyclicality of the mining industry for, for all sorts of business cycle reasons, uh, we're, we're moving into an era where the whole, uh, the whole idea shifts upward in terms of difficulty. Everything, it's tougher to do geology, it's tougher to do exploration, tougher for permits, tougher for development, tougher for supply chain, uh, tougher for financing, ESG, First Nations, and then of course the, the energy angle because you know what is mining? Mining is applied energy. Mining is electricity and diesel fuel applied to rocks in the ground. And all of those things are going up in price yeah. uh, and, and it doesn't look like we're really going to see a, a rebate backwards. from And, from and labor. Price and, of labor and, is going up. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, just on the demand side, uh, what, Isaiah, what do you think is going to be the main driver uh, uh, for the silver demand in the near future? Well, I, I think uh, the electronics industry in a broad sense is, is, is a big and growing uh, user for these things. I mean, you know, your iPhone, your, the keyboard and your computer, the laptops, I mean, all of those things. The world is, you know, getting more and more electronic every day. Uh, solar panels, again, use uh, quite a bit of, of uh, silver. Uh, and so the electronics are going to be driving it. But then also there's that shadow monetary angle right. as well. Uh, you know, when, 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 the, when the U.S. government says, oh, inflation is 8.6%, well, yeah, they, what they really mean is it's 17%, but they don't want to tell you that, you know. And so uh, the, the, the value of the dollar is going down, even though the dollar is strengthening against other currencies. But, you know, your, your money buys less, you buy less gas, you buy less food, or it costs you more for the same amount. And uh, silver is going to ride that wave as well. So between the electronics that make people's lives hopefully better uh, and uh, the monetary angle, I mean, I, 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 see a, I see a rising floor for silver over time. Absolutely. That has a reciprocal effect too, right, in what Peter was saying. You can't get ball mills, right? You can't get parts. I mean, how many new mines were, were supposed to come online that are probably stalled right now? And you can't even get workers. I mean, the labor market participation rate is, is incredibly low right now. I mean, I don't know if you guys are suffering from the same thing right now, but I mean, it's, it's, it's challenging just to find people to work, you know? And that's broader than silver, right? That's across the industry. Exactly, yeah. exactly. But that's, that's hindering, you know, new silver mines from coming online at the moment, and even current uh, producing mines. So, I mean, there's your, you know, supply just coming down even yes. further, right? And on, and on the demand side, Peter, what do you see as driving the, uh, the future of silver demand? I haven't focused on that much, but I know that jewelry, right, batteries, uh, electronics, and a warehouse of value. There's a whole community that calls themselves 
uh, the silver stackers or the silver backs. And what they are, are people who buy physical silver and stack it away. Because physical silver right now is around $40 an ounce to take delivery, whereas paper silver is 20, 21, 22. So it's a significant part of the silver market to take that physical silver. Well, I think we've had a pretty good discussion here today uh, on the silver panel. And I'd like to thank you all for your time and enjoy the rest of the show. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, everyone.